Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. And today I'm going to be looking at Napoleon's masterpiece, Austerlitz 1805. Now, Austerlitz, I know, is one of, or I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, but anyways, um, one of the more famous points of Napoleon's victory, arguably his most brilliant victory that he ever pulled off. And we're going to be taking a look at Epic History TV's take on these events. Now, you guys really seem to enjoy the Little Corporal video, which was Napoleon in Italy, part one and part two by Epic History TV. And a bunch of you guys asked me to react to more Napoleon videos for Epic History TV. So I'm going to do exactly that. As I've said before, this isn't a period of history that I really know too much about. So for example, with the World War I or World War II videos, I'm pausing a lot and really, you know, pr trying to provide more historical context. But with these ones, I just sort of kick back and watch Napoleon be the brilliant individual that he is. So without further ado, let's get into it. In December 1804, in the Cathedral of Notre Dame in Paris, Napoleon Bonaparte crowned himself Emperor of the French. Awesome. Europe had never- Someone corrected me on that, by the way. Napoleon is not the Emperor of France, but the Emperor of the French. Key point. Has seen such a sudden and dramatic rise to power a son of impoverished Corsican nobility to military dictator of France in little more than 10 years. Yep. Revolution and war had cleared Napoleon's path to the throne. War would dominate his 10 year reign. A conflict unprecedented in history that would leave millions dead and a continent in turmoil. Yep. And not only that, but would completely reshape Europe for the next 50 to 70 years, basically up until the First World War, that the balance of power, maybe actually the Franco-Prussian War, but anyways, um, the, the balance of power in Europe remained relatively stable past the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, so obviously this was the Conference of Vienna that was held, a hugely important conference in a video by a certain YouTuber um, that's been reacted to by a bunch of other um, sort of history reaction channels that I will get around to one of these days. It's very long, but yeah, one of the most Im important conferences of European history and really did shape Europe for the time to come, as well as how much Napoleon shaped Europe as well. Eight months after Napoleon's coronation, the French Empire and its Spanish ally were at war with Britain, and Napoleon Shocking. had assembled an army of 180,000 men along the Channel coast. But as long as the British Royal Navy ruled the seas, invasion was impossible. But nor could Britain challenge France on land. And yep. so British Prime Minister William Pitt tried to build a European coalition against Napoleon, using diplomacy and gold. Fat Britain would prove Napoleon's most steadfast enemy, and its press delighted in relentless mockery of the French Emperor. Britain and France were old rivals, in Europe and overseas. But now, Pitt feared Napoleon's conquests had made France too powerful. The French Emperor had to be defeated, and Europe's balance of power restored if there was ever to be lasting peace. Is bony really an insult? Like I've noticed here that says the contrast on or, or bulky and bony. Is that just because it's Bonaparte, bony? Like, was that really the best they could come up with? I mean, it doesn't even seem like that insulting of a name to be perfectly honest. So, okay, I guess that's the best that they could come up with in the day. Pitt found willing allies in Europe, among monarchs who despised Napoleon as a product of the French Revolution and a dangerous threat to the existing order. Austria harboured the deepest grievances, having seen her influence in Germany and Italy steadily eroded by French victories. The final straw came in May 1804, when Napoleon had also crowned himself King of Italy in Milan. Austria, Russia, Sweden and Naples joined Britain in an alliance known as the Third Coalition and devised and an ambitious it's, it's plan not be the last for a one. series of joint offensives against France. 
The main attack would be made by a combined Austro-Russian army, advancing across the Rhine into France. But Napoleon got word of their plans, and reacted with typical speed and decision. He was determined to strike first, before the Allies could join forces, and ordered his army, now renamed La Grande Armée, to march to the River Rhine. His target was the Austrian army of General Mack, which had made a premature advance against Bavaria, a French ally, and was now dangerously isolated from the other Allied armies. Perfect. Perfect for Napoleon. Napoleon ordered Marshal Murat, his famously flamboyant cavalry commander, to make faint attacks through the Black Forest, while the rest of his army, advancing at speed, enveloped Mack's army from the north. That summer, Napoleon's Grande Armée was at its most formidable. Well-trained, highly motivated, its regiments at full strength. What's more, it had been newly reorganised according to the corps system, yeah. later imitated by virtually every army in the world. Each corps, commanded by a marshal, was a mini-army of 15 to 30,000 soldiers, with its own infantry, cavalry, artillery and supporting arms, such as reconnaissance, engineers and transport. This meant each corps could march and fight for a limited time in and what's important to note here too is that, so these officers that he's appointing, these are men that are actually highly, highly capable. So traditionally, officers would be people of the nobility that then they would basically sort of pay their way into a commission or through sort of their extensions and their connections, they would end up being officers in the military. And yes, some of them were obviously capable enough, but there was this issue of people that were not capable. So these men, while there was obviously some form of, you know, some slight form of connection and everything like this, these are incredibly competent generals. I mean, Marmont, Davout, Ney, all incredibly, incredibly competent. And at this point, some of the best generals in Europe, on top of the best general in Europe, Napoleon himself. So, yeah, this is it's kind of cool to see how we basically sort of use this system today as well. It's, it's obviously a little bit different due to how warfare has changed, but the idea of basically breaking into corps or regiments, as we would call them, at least in Canada, is, is very, very similar. And I think that that's kind of cool. It's sort of something that's somewhat left over from the Napoleonic Wars. Nears and transport. This meant each corps could march and fight for a limited time independently allowing Napoleon to break with the old doctrine of keeping his army concentrated, and advance with his corps widely dispersed. Yeah. This helped to disguise his real objective, and increased movement speed, because the army could advance along multiple roads and live off the land, taking its supplies from scattered villages. Sorry, thing I should note too, a regiment is not specifically a corps, so you can have multiple corps within an infantry regiment, for example. That's just one thing I want to clear up. Other than relying on slow-moving supply wagons. When the enemy's main force was located, the army could quickly concentrate for battle. This is how Napoleon's army was able to move at a speed that often surprised and disorientated his enemies. Mac didn't realize the danger he was in until it was too late. Which you gotta think, this is the third coalition that has now fought against Napoleon, and they're still making the same mistakes. And it wouldn't be until the sixth, seventh coalition that eventually would defeat him. So, ugh, crazy. And also, one thing I wanna note too is that this video was made four years ago, as of 2023. The difference now that Epic History TV, like their production value, Wow, crazy. It's almost 10, 20 times better than it was before. So, cool to see the improvements over time. Napoleon's fast-moving corps crossed the Danube behind him and surrounded his army. Mack launched a series of poorly coordinated counter-attacks. But despite some desperate fighting, the Austrians couldn't break out of the trap. 
Mack hoped that Kutuzov's Russian army could arrive in time to save him, but the Russians were still 160 miles away. Phew. And so, at Ulm, well. on the 19th of October, just six weeks into the war, Mack surrendered his army to Napoleon. <laughs> The Six French weeks. took nearly 60,000 Austrian prisoners, and Napoleon had struck his first devastating blow against God. the coalition. Wow. Russian Six General weeks. Mikhail Kutuzov was an experienced and wary commander, more cautious than Mack. His army was exhausted after its 900-mile march from Russia, but hearing of the Austrians' surrender at Ulm, and knowing he wasn't strong enough to face Napoleon alone, he immediately ordered a retreat. Smart. Napoleon pursued. The Russians fought several sharp rearguard actions, but could not save the Austrian capital, Vienna, which the French occupied hey, on the 12th of October. Kutuzov slipped away to Olmutz in today's Czech Republic, where he was joined by reinforcements as well as Emperor Alexander of Russia and Emperor Francis of Austria in person. Hmm. Napoleon was furious that Kutuzov had escaped. By now his army was also exhausted, and far from home, with winter approaching. He needed to force a decisive battle quickly. Fortunately for him, the overconfident 27-year-old Russian Emperor sought the glory of battle, overriding the concerns of his veteran commander, General Kutuzov. If I remember correctly, I think Kutuzov, he hangs on, and then when Napoleon invades Russia, Kutuzov is also one of the generals that's facing off against Napoleon, and basically just keeps retreating backwards so that they need to go further and further into Russia. If I remember correctly, I think Kutuzov did fight Napoleon later in Russia itself. With the Allied army closing in, Napoleon ordered his corps to rapidly concentrate on a battlefield he had carefully selected, near the town of Austerlitz. Ah, it's in, it's in Napoleon Czechia. oversaw the dispositions gotcha. of his army late into the night, then grabbed a few hours sleep beside a campfire. Dawn would mark the first anniversary of his coronation as emperor, and promised a battle that would make or break his young empire. Too perfect. Too perfect. The morning of the 2nd of December 1805 was cold and bright with a heavy mist. Two armies of near equal size faced each other across a seven mile wide battlefield but the Allies held the high ground of the Pratzen Heights, while French Third Corps under Marshal Davout was still marching to the battlefield. Seeing Napoleon's thinly stretched mm. right flank, okay. the Allies planned a large-scale attack from the Pratzen Heights to steamroller the French right, before swinging round to envelop Napoleon's army. But then wouldn't Little they be attacked? They know, Napoleon was counting on his weak right wing, luring the Allies into just such a move. Right. Whereupon he would launch his own yeah. attack on the Pratzen Heights. <laughs> I was going to say, the they're, not just gonna, in they're not just going to stand there and, and, and wait and watch. Half. His bold plan relied on his correct prediction of Allied movements, the speedy arrival of Davout's Third Corps on his right, and a perfectly timed counterattack. Because that's what I was thinking, was that I assume then that they don't know that these guys are here. Because then if you're if you're swinging like a gate here, right, and then you get attacked in the middle, that's a perfect way to get cut off from all your troops, right? As well as if they're attacking, so can Napoleon. The battle began around 7 a.m. as Austrian troops of General Keinmeier's advance guard clashed with French troops defending the village of Telnitz. The, of these battles, the face of overwhelming ginormous. odds, the French Absolutely fought ginormous. stubbornly and bravely, but gradually they were forced back. But the Allies, instead of carrying out their great enveloping attack, did nothing. The morning mist and the late arrival of orders 
had led to confusion and delay, and it was mm. another hour before the first three Allied columns were on the move. Soon, fierce fighting erupted around Sokolnitz village and castle. Marshal Davout's corps, which had just force-marched 70 miles in two days, now arrived to strengthen the French right wing. 70 mile march in two days. So that's over 100 kilometers. I don't remember what exactly one mile to one kilometer is, but I think that's over 100 kilometers in two days to then immediately fight in a battle. Wow. I can't even... Jeez, the level of discipline you got to maintain for that. I can't even imagine being force marched 100 kilometers in two days and then immediately joining into combat as well. Whew. Around 9 a.m., his lead infantry brigade appeared stone. suddenly through the mist and retook Telnitz, before being driven back in turn by Austrian hussars. Two more of Davout's brigades reinforced French troops at Sokolnitz. As the mist began to clear, Napoleon saw that, as he'd hoped, the Allied left was moving off the Pratzen Heights and he ordered Marshal Soult's 4th Corps to begin its attack. To the alarm of Allied commanders, two French infantry divisions, until now hidden by the mist, were suddenly seen advancing straight towards the Allied centre. Ah, that's crazy! General Kutuzov was forced to hurriedly organise a defence of the heights, using troops of four column. Two hours of bloody fighting followed. Musket fire was so rapid and furious that both sides were soon low on ammunition and turned to the bayonet. I mean, assuming that this is relatively accurate to the battle scenes, I just look at the chaos, man. Thousands of men everywhere, villages burning, the amount of musket fire, the amount of smoke that these cannons and these muskets are producing. God, I can only imagine what that would look like. Jeez, completely epic in, in, in the scale of it. By 11 a.m., the French, with the advantage in training and discipline, had secured the heights and driven a deep wedge into the Allied position. To the north, a giant cavalry battle developed. While a Russian force from General Bagration's advance guard captured the village of Bosenitz before it was halted by cannon fire from the Santon Hill. A decisive charge by six regiments of French heavy cavalry finally drove back the Allies, allowing Marshal Lannes' V Corps to move forward and seize Blasowitz and Krug. We should visit here, it's not that far away. From now, Vienna. Grand Duke Constantine, commanding the Russian Imperial Guard, led forward this last Allied reserve in a desperate bid to reclaim the Pratzen Heights. A battalion of the French 4th Line Regiment was charged down by Russian Guard cavalry, losing its eagle standard in bloody fighting. Napoleon, who'd moved up to the heights, sent in his own Guard cavalry. In this grim melee between Whoa. the elite horsemen of both armies, the French finally prevailed. Wow. Sent in his own guard. Napoleon cool. had broken the Allied center. Now, to close the trap on the Allied left wing, I was gonna say. still locked in heavy fighting around Sokolnitz. Around Just 2 p.m., Napoleon ordered right four around. divisions to swing south and cut off their oh, retreat. Oh, no! General Buxhauden, commanding the Allied left, only now saw the danger he was in. Oh, man. Attacked from three sides, the only escape was south. Many of his troops were forced to flee across frozen ponds. Oh, no. And then they shot... Oh, no. French and then they artillery just shot opened them. fire, trying to smash the ice with their cannonballs. Oh, my God. About 200 men and dozens of horses drowned in the freezing water. I'm <sighs> but not the many thousands of Napoleon's propaganda. But still, what a devastating, like even just 
morale wise and just psychologically all these troops that then have to go on to fight another day and just wow wow that's all i can say the french emperor had won a brilliant victory really his army yeah. had taken more than 10,000 prisoners and captured 45 enemy standards thousands of dead and wounded of all sides littered the battlefield many left untended for days Six to one. The Battle wow. of the Three Emperors, as it became known, was a crushing blow to the Third Coalition. I was going to say. As Russian forces retreated back to Russia, Francis I of Austria was forced to accept a humiliating settlement with France, agreeing to pay a 40 million franc indemnity and give up more territory in exchange for peace. But meanwhile, News had reached Napoleon of a disastrous Franco-Spanish defeat at sea, off Cape Trafalgar. British Admiral Lord Nelson, ah, at the yes. cost of his own life, had masterminded a victory so complete that it ensured British naval dominance, not just for the rest of the war, but for the next 100 years. Cool. Fascinating. I'll have to check that out then. Britain, master of the sea. Napoleon, unbeatable on land. land. Yep. The whale and the elephant, neither able to challenge the other in its own domain. Never heard that before, the whale and the elephant. Cool. When William Pitt received news of Napoleon's victory at Austerlitz, he's supposed to have said, roll up that <laughs> map of Europe. It will not be wanted these 10 years. Yep. A month later, Pitt was dead. But his warning that Europe faced another 10 years of war and upheaval was to prove prophetic. Definitely. Napoleon Bonaparte was the ultimate disruptor of European history. I think this is an ad here. One man who transformed a continent. Yeah. If you want. Yeah, so fantastic video. Austerlitz 1805. That is an absolutely brilliant victory. For sure. And like I said, I'm going to be checking out more of the Napoleon videos, 1806, 1807, 1808, etc. All the ones from Epic History TV. I'll probably do them in order, but let me know what you think down below of whether if there's any specific one that I should check out. I know the Russia one, it's like an hour and 30 minutes long. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. But I want to see what you guys think. Let me know in the comment section down below. As always, thank you very much for all your support. I really appreciate it. Take care. All the best. I'll see you guys in the next video.